You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. Episode 33, The Inverted Tower of Secrets. Last time, I finished examining the cards in the Tarot Major Arcana, whose symbolism can help to illuminate various elements and plot points of the first Harry Potter book. This episode is the first of a two-episode arc examining the cards in the Tarot Major Arcana that are linked to the next book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Once again, if you missed the last few episodes, you should go back to episode 30 and proceed from there. And of course, if you're jumping into this here without having heard any previous episodes, you should definitely go back to the beginning, because all of the information in Quantum Harry the podcast builds on everything that's come before. For instance, previous episodes that have a particular bearing on this two-episode arc are Episode 3, Iron Maiden, about the ruling archetype for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and Episodes 12 through 14, which are about the role of games, toys, and particularly fairy tales in Chamber of Secrets. I'll be referring to all of these episodes throughout this one and the next. Anytime you want to listen or re-listen to any episode, just go to the Quantum Harry Twitter page, at QH Podcast, and click on the link in the pinned tweet to go to the Quantum Harry episode guide, which has links to all of the episodes in audio and video formats, plus links to blog posts related to some of the episodes. There are also images of the Tarot Major Arcana cards on the Quantum Harry blog, my Instagram account, the Quantum Harry Pinterest board, and the Quantum Harry Facebook group. And when the video version of this episode is posted on YouTube, you'll be able to see all of the images I'm talking about in the video. The second book in the Harry Potter series, being J.K. Rowling's retelling of the grim version of Little Red Riding Hood, is possibly one of the cleverest things she's done in the series, as I talked about in episodes 12 through 14. However, when looking at this book in light of the second column of Tarot Major Arcana cards, and in the next episode, the second set of sequence cards, 4, 5, and 6, even more cleverness is revealed, and a wicked sense of humor though anyone who's followed J.K. Rowling on Twitter probably knows all about her sense of humor. When we arrange the Tarot Major Arcana cards numbered 1 through 21 into a grid of three rows and seven columns, the second column, which is aligned with Chamber of Secrets, has the High Priestess at the top, card number 2, the Hermit in the middle, card number 9, and the Tower of Destruction, or the Lightning Struck Tower, also just called the Tower, at the bottom of the column, card number 16. In episode 3, Iron Maiden, I talked about the Maiden being the ruling archetype for the second book in the series, and Ginny being the best embodiment of the Maiden in Chamber of Secrets, both because Ginny's actions set the plot in motion, but also because during the climax of the book, Harry must step into her shoes in order to resolve the plot, just as he stepped into Dumbledore's shoes in the first book, Dumbledore being the best embodiment of the ruling archetype for that book, The Wise Old Man. But just as Dumbledore has a corresponding tarot archetype whose card is the top of the first column of tarot major arcana cards, Ginny embodies the tarot archetype at the top of the second column, the High Priestess. The Waite Smith High Priestess card shows a woman on a throne between two columns, representing the, quote, symbolic pillars that in the account in 1 Kings 7, 15-22, are said to have stood to the north and the south of the door of Solomon's temple. Unquote, according to Sally Nichols, in her book, Jung and Tarot, An Archetypal Journey. The priestess holds an open book, and a crescent moon is near her feet, linking her to the tripartite goddess, the one who combines the maiden, mother, and crone, though the crescent moon is specifically linked to the maiden aspect of the great goddess. This card was first called the Papess, P-A-P-E-S-S-E, but it was changed to the High Priestess, probably because the idea of a female pope was heretical to many Catholics. Behind the high priestess, there is often a tapestry depicting pomegranates. Persephone ate pomegranate seeds when she was in Hades, and these are also symbols of fertility that were found carved into Solomon's temple. The priestess could be considered an embodiment of Sophia, wisdom personified, for which Solomon was also known, or Persephone, 
whose imprisonment in Hades and release is one of the myths that we can see in the plot of Chamber of Secrets, since Ginny is taken down to the chamber, a symbolic underworld, by the one who rules the chamber, who is equivalent to the god of the underworld, Hades, in Greek mythology, and the world was in danger of ending after Ginny was taken, since Hogwarts was going to close. The columns flanking the high priestess mark her as a gatekeeper, like Myrtle in the girls' bathroom, which is where the Chamber of Secrets entrance is located. Harry, who played the role of a bishop during the life-sized chess game in the first book, is the holy man, the hermit, card number nine, who speaks an esoteric language, parcel tongue, allowing him to pass into that realm. Myrtle, like Ginny, shows an interest in Harry, an archetypal youth, which is expected for someone in the role of the maiden slash high priestess. Harry passes through multiple gateways to reach the quote unquote temple of the chamber. It is treated by Tom Riddle as a holy place, a sanctum sanctorum. Joseph Campbell writes The approaches and entrances to temples are flanked and defended by colossal gargoyles dragons, lions, devil slayers with drawn swords, resentful dwarfs, winged bulls. These are the threshold guardians to ward away all incapable of encountering the higher silences within. They illustrate the fact that the devotee at the moment of entry into a temple undergoes a metamorphosis. His secular character remains without. He sheds it as a snake its slough. Harry even finds a literal sloughed snakeskin immediately inside the Chamber of Secrets as if Rowling had been reading her Joseph Campbell when she wrote this part of the second book. In addition to the seven thresholds he crosses with Hagrid or with his help in the first book, he encounters threshold guardians in each book. In addition to the seven thresholds in the first book, there's the Whomping Willow that guards the entrance to the tunnel leading to the Shrieking Shack, the dragons of the first Triwizard Tournament task, the entrance to the Ministry of Magic in the fifth book, and so on. Each one is similar to what Campbell writes about, but is also subtly different. The High Priestess on the card holds a book on her lap, and Ginny's relationship with a book is the impetus for the plot of Chamber of Secrets. The book on the card is supposedly the Torah, and in Chamber of Secrets, Harry has his symbolic confirmation or bar mitzvah, his spiritual coming of age, which I talk about in episode 13, Deus Ex Machina. That Harry, like Ginny, writes in the diary and is the only other person who does so is another way that they are equals. Another meaning associated with the High Priestess card is esoteric religious experience, so it's fitting that Harry has his spiritual awakening in the book ruled by the maiden slash High Priestess, both embodied by Ginny. As I mentioned in episode 30, Harry and Tarot, each Tarot Major Arcana card has at least one other card linked to it numerically. For those who are wondering where this method of linking the cards numerically came from, it's pure arithmancy, Hermione Granger's favorite subject, ironically, since it is a form of divination, and we know what she thinks of that class. The cards that are numerically linked to the High Priestess are Strength, card number 11, because 1 plus 1 is 2, the number on the High Priestess card, and Judgment, number 20, because 2 plus 0 is also 2. A woman wrestling with a lion, Strength, could be seen as Ginny again, as I mentioned in the last episode, but in the second book she is struggling against an adversary who is poised to overwhelm her at any moment. She temporarily gets the upper hand when she throws Tom Riddle's diary in Myrtle's toilet to get rid of it, but she sees it fall out of Harry's bag when he is accosted by the dwarf slash Cupid who's delivering her singing valentine to him, so she steals it back, probably to prevent Tom Riddle from telling Harry about her role in what's been happening in the castle. After retrieving the diary from his dorm, she again falls under its spell, and this is almost fatal to her. We see firsthand in Deathly Hallows how dangerous it can be to regularly put yourself in close proximity to a horcrux, and it must have been even worse really for an 11-year-old girl who didn't know what she was handling, as opposed to Harry, Ron, and Hermione, who were of age during the horcrux hunt and knew the danger each time they took turns wearing the locket horcrux. The judgment card could be referring to something that's a little more cheerful than the struggle depicted on the strength card. It shows bodies rising from their graves on Judgment Day, 
which we can think of as the petrifaction victims awakening after the mandrake potion returns them to their original states before they all encountered the basilisk. Skipping over the card in the middle of the second column for a moment, let's go straight to the bottom of the column, where we find the Tower card, also called the Tower of Destruction, or the name Trelawney uses in Half-Blood Prince, the Lightning Struck Tower. The importance that this card will have to the sixth book when it reappears is fairly obvious. Dumbledore dies on a tower. However, its role is less clear in reference to the second book until we consider that the second book includes an inverted tower, the chamber, thrusting down into the earth rather than toward the sky. According to Sally Nichols, each time this card appears, the tower carries the same meaning, quote, transformation, the shattering of illusion, and sudden change. For once, Rowling may be using some rules of tarot divination. In readings, it's important whether a card is right side up or upside down. The chamber being in essence an upside down tower could point to its meaning being that of an upside down tower card. When this card is upright in a reading, also called a tarot spread, it's only bad news, which is why Trelawney was so alarmed about the card turning up repeatedly. So we could take an inverted tower card to mean that someone is in a bad situation but will have a good end to all of the chaos and strife. And in fact, this is a fitting description of the end of Chamber of Secrets, when Harry prevents Ginny from being expelled, the diary is destroyed, the basilisk is slain, the petrifaction victims wake up, Hagrid returns from Azkaban, Dumbledore is returned to his post, and Harry frees Dobby. This card is also linked to the Tower of Babel, which is considered by some theologians to prefigure, which is theology speak for foreshadow, the events that occurred at Pentecost, when Jesus' disciples found, after the flames of the Holy Spirit appeared on their heads, that they could speak in languages they never could before, the better to evangelize, as I talked about in episode 13. So in addition to the High Priestess being linked to religious initiation, the Tower card can also link this book's Pentecostal theme, epitomized by Harry stating his faith in the god figure Dumbledore, and flames appearing on his head in the form of Fox the Phoenix, a stand-in for the Holy Spirit. After this, Harry is spiritually mature and able to slay the Basilisk. The link to the Tower of Babel can also be a reference to Harry's ability to speak Parseltongue, the language of the other. On top of all of that, Sally Nichols says that the Tower card is also linked to, quote, Kundalini experiences, which is a yoga reference. Kundalini happens to mean coiled like a serpent, or perhaps a basilisk. As I mentioned earlier, the Tower card is often called the Lightning Struck Tower, as it is, in fact, by J.K. Rowling in Half-Blood Prince. Tall structures like towers attract lightning. One could say, then, that they attract Harry, who is marked by a lightning-shaped scar. So in Chamber of Secrets, it's as if the inverted tower of the chamber is struck by Harry, who crosses the threshold into this forbidden precinct. In each of the first six books, he harrows a metaphorical hell, and in the seventh, he literally dies and rises from the dead. This is another reason that his confrontation with Voldemort in the first book is with a metaphorical devil. He passes a Cerberus-like three-headed dog who is guarding the entrance to a symbolic underworld. In this book, the chamber is Harry's metaphorical hell, which goes along with the High Priestess's link to the goddess Persephone. The tower depicted on most cards is damaged and under attack. When Harry, Ron, and Gilderoy Lockhart go down into the chamber, they cause a cave-in which puts Ron and Lockhart on one side of the fallen debris and Harry on the other. Harry must experience his spiritual coming of age on his own without anyone else accompanying him into the Forbidden Precinct. The Tower card, number 16, is linked to the Chariot card, number 7, because 1 plus 6 is 7. The Chariot card is the tarot equivalent to the archetype of the liminal being, one of Harry's two non-tarot archetypes, the other being the youth. This is yet another card linked to the second book that points to Harry's status as a holy man, like the hermit, someone who can cross thresholds and access mystical realms. Harry experiences a spiritual coming of age in the second book, a virtual confirmation or bar mitzvah. 
He is on the cusp of adulthood. He is an initiate, which is what liminality is all about. In episode 8, Have You Tried Not Being Liminal? I quoted from Bernadette Linbosky's article, Liminal Places and Liminal States in Big Little, by John Crowley, published in the New York Review of Science Fiction in November of 2012. Bosky wrote, one of the goals of ritual is to turn boundaries into thresholds, as when a shaman crosses the barrier between our world and the other world, and then personally forms a bridge between them. Roads and paths can be liminal also. They lead from one place to another, joining them, but also help define, for instance, what is safe versus what is not, as in the story Little Red Riding Hood. The chariot being linked to the tower card simply reinforces Harry's status as a liminal being, as someone who speaks the language of the other and bridges worlds, who goes to the realm of the gods, the metaphorical underworlds he encounters in each book, and either returns with a boon or having lifted a curse from the world, which is the best way to describe his slaying the basilisk. The chariot could also be a reference to the flying Ford Anglia, this unusual car takes Harry from captivity in Surrey to the Weasley home and then from London to Hogwarts. It is not operated like most cars are, but is controlled by magic. A driver is depicted on the chariot card, but he doesn't hold reins to control the two creatures who pull the chariot. He holds a wand to control them instead. In other words, the driver uses magic. Just as Harry embodies the archetype of the liminal being, whose tarot equivalent is the chariot, the Ford Anglia also embodies a threshold-crossing liminal being, a woods car instead of the woods man of the Little Red Riding Hood, when it rescues him and Ron from the giant spiders in the forest. So Harry is rescued by this hero before he goes into the chamber, and later becomes the embodiment of this type of savior himself, in order to rescue Ginny from the metaphorical wolf embodied by Tom Riddle. Returning to the center of the second column, between the High Priestess and the Tower, we find the Hermit. Harry is in multiple tarot roles in this book, but all of these roles are religious figures in some way. The third religious figure, after the Hermit and the Chariot, is one of the three sequence cards for the second book, which I'll talk about in the next episode. Most Hermit cards show an old man with a beard, wearing a hooded gray cloak, which is sometimes described as an invisibility cloak. The hermit stands in a bleak, sometimes snowy landscape, holding a staff, but whether the staff is a walking stick or a wizard's staff is unclear, and he has a glowing lantern that sometimes has a Star of David on it. Hermits are by their nature shut away from the rest of human society. Harry begins the second book in captivity, unable to leave his room or to access his magic books and equipment. The hermit on the card is not shut away, though, as you would expect a hermit to be. On the card, he's a wandering mendicant, and in fact, Harry is soon on the move, in the Weasley's flying car, their chariot, in other words. The lantern with the Star of David could also be yet another reference to Harry's spiritual enlightenment or coming of age. The card linked to the hermit card, number 9, is the moon card, number 18, because 1 plus 8 is 9. The moon card has some very interesting symbols on it in relation to this book. A very typical moon card shows two towers looming in the distance, a dog and a wolf that seem to be baying at the moon, and a crab or a lobster-like creature is emerging from some water in the foreground. This is a connection to the astrological sign of Cancer, the crab. Those born under this sign are also called moon children. A crescent moon is on the High Priestess card as well, an aspect of the three-faced goddess, specifically the maiden in the Maiden Mother Crone Trio. But the creature in the water on the moon card could represent two fearsome creatures in Chamber of Secrets, one of whom fears the other, the basilisk and Aragog, the giant spider. As I talked about in episode 14, The Devil's Game, there is a trip into a forest primeval in the second book, one of the many reenactments of the fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood in Chamber of Secrets. 
when Harry and Ron follow the spiders into the forest and meet Aragog, nearly becoming a tasty snack for him and his family. Such a trip is easily linked to the moon, which represents the unconscious mind. The moon is a bit like the flip side of the hermit's lantern. The hermit pursues conscious enlightenment, but the moon is tied to unconscious enlightenment and intuition, which is also linked to the high priestess. Both have their place in the second book. The moon is linked to memory as well. Sally Nichols writes about, quote, a legend which tells that each night Lady Moon gathers unto herself all the discarded and forgotten dreams of mankind. These she stores in a cup till dawn. This use of a cup or vessel to store memories is reminiscent of Dumbledore's Poncive, which is appropriate for the card that will be at the bottom of the fourth column, which is aligned with Goblet of Fire, the fourth book of the series, in which we see the Poncive for the first time. Memories are also important in the second book, or rather, a lack of memories, which is what Gilderoy Lockhart's victims suffer after he learns how a variety of talented witches and wizards achieved the accomplishments Lockhart now claims. He steals their memories of these experiences, just as he attempts to steal Ron and Harry's memories of his confession of fraud. When the memory charm he attempts to cast with Ron's broken wand backfires, he becomes unable to access his memories, and therefore his very identity, his concept of selfhood. In terms of the tarot story, the moon card also represents the dark night of the soul, the bleakest moment of the hero's saga. In Chamber of Secrets, Harry has never felt worse in his life, so far, than when he and the other students are informed that Ginny has been taken into the chamber. The victim is no longer tangential to him, like Colin Creevy and Justin Finch Fletchley, nor is the victim's ailment something curable like petrifaction, which is the situation one of his best friends, Hermione, is in. Now Ginny, his best friend's sister, is lost, it seems. He literally feels like he has nothing to lose by trying to save her. In the first book, Harry as Justice mediates between Dumbledore the Magician and the Philosopher's Stone on the one hand, and the servant of the devil, Quirrell, and embodiment of the devil, Voldemort, on the other. In Chamber of Secrets, as a holy man, a hermit, and a liminal being, Harry again mediates between the embodiment of the top card, Ginny, the high priestess, and the chamber, the inverted tower card, a literal and figurative underworld, the realm of a devil equivalent, Tom Riddle, by using the wisdom of the hermit, the intuition of the moon, and the language of the other referenced by the tower and the chariot cards to defeat the master of the inverted tower, resurrect the high priestess, and bring his dying world back to life. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. Whether you are streaming on iTunes, Stitcher, CastBox, or another podcatcher, please leave a rating and or a comment and share episodes of Quantum Harry with your friends. Next time on Quantum Harry, episode 34, Emperors, Fools, and Angels. The conclusion of this two-episode arc about tarot imagery and symbolism in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I hope you'll join me. Thank you.